in the 70s, it wasn't like that. Oh, blimey. Rotten himself, you know, he'd had a terrible childhood with meningitis and a coma and all the rest of it and had to educate himself. It's probably hard for people now to get their head round. And he was telling us in the queue about this group called the Sex Pistols. The singer did handstands and vomited on stage. And this sounded incredibly exciting. I've never been able to verify that either of these things ever happened. The vomiting is at least plausible. Maybe it happened once. Handstands, can't really see that. I can't see Johnny Rotten or John Lydon as now doing handstands on stage. No. I remember Britain as a black and white monochrome grey place. Something had arrived it, that the establishment or the media didn't know how to, to tackle. A lot of the people around feel very guilty or bad about what happened to Sid really. It's all a bit of a blur. Like <laughs> You probably realise that a lot of my life is like this. A taste of what's coming up with Dave Simpson, the author of the book Sex Pistols, I Want to Be Me. And stay tuned, because there are some amazing stories there. Now, please subscribe to this channel. That way you'll hear when I update any new interviews, so you could be the first to see them. Right, let's get on with it. Here's Dave Simpson talking about Sex Pistols, I Want to Be Me. <laughs> You're listening to Pop, The History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. So Dave Simpson, welcome. You're a Guardian uh, music critic and journalist, and of course, author. And your books include The Fallen, In and Out of Britain's Most Insane Group, the story, yeah. of course, of The Fall, and the book we're going to talk about today, Sex Pistols, I Want to Be Me. But first, I want to start a little bit with you and your early life and what music meant to you growing up. Oh, blimey. It was kind of everything. Uh, I mean, it, it really was everything from probably about the age of six, I think. Um, it, this might, it, I don't think this is uncoincidental. My, my dad died when I was six, and he'd got me into music in a, in a way by, he was a pianist at the, he was like, played piano at the working men's club nearby and he sometimes would take me down there um and he bought me a little piano but he also introduced me they had a drummer called jeff who had a beverly red sparkle drum kit and who gave me a pair of drumsticks and that felt like quite a moment i didn't i didn't i didn't i, I did get a drum kit but probably about 10 years later and but i kept the sticks you know and eventually i did use those sticks and that that felt like a kind of ceremonial thing so i never I, I didn't have that much interest in the piano but but after dad died um i just found that pop music really spoke to me you know i mean before that i remember dad getting me into stuff like how much is that doggy in the window and uh puff the magic dragon was another song that i, I loved when i was really little but but once it was just me and my mum before I went to school on a morning, I, I'd listen to like Tony Blackburn's show on Radio One back then, and he'd placed all the. I, I suppose it was like the beginnings of glam rock and Philadelphia soul music as well. Um, but certain records just really, really leapt out um, that spoke to my situation, like "Alone Again" naturally by Gilbert O'Sullivan, um, a, a record called um, "All by Myself." Who's Carbon. Eric that's Carmen. right. That's yeah. right. Eric Carmen. That's right. Um, uh, John Miles' music was my first love. It will be my last. All these sort of things kind of spoke to me as a sort of little kid trying to make sense of where his dad had gone, you know. And but also stuff like Slade. I got I got so into Slade. I remember hearing "Cos I Love You" on Tony Blackburn. That was the first one of those I heard. And around the same time, I heard Rider White Swan by T-Rex. And there was something really off-kilter about those records that I couldn't quite... I'd not, you know, nothing I'd heard before sounded like them. And then, you know, dare I say it, Gary Glitter as well with the Glitter Stomp. You know, those three groups really crashed into my world, really. And I can, I can vividly... I mean, I lived in a semi-detached house on a council estate in North Leeds. And I vividly remember kind of trying to imagine what it would be like if there were like enormous like 40 foot speakers on the top of every house that would play Take Me Back Home by Slade at deafening volume. 
Um, sadly, Leeds Council never never installed anything like that. But uh, I did used to when, it, when I got a Fidelity record player for my, I think about ninth or tenth birthday, something like that. And so suddenly I could play records. And I didn't have any albums, but I had singles, and I used to play them very very loudly. And finally, I got the the Slade album where the, the, the you know they're like this on the front cover with the S L A D written across the the hand and. That was the only album I owned for five years, but I used to play that all the time when I got home from school. That that would go straight on and, and play a, a reasonable volume. Um, actually, that's not quite. I did have. A, I also had a Top of the Pops album, which was kind of the hits of the day performed by people in Holland, I believe. So you had kind of fast fa facsimile versions of stuff like Metal Guru by T Rex and oh, I can't remember what else was on there, but. Though that you know that I didn't really count that because it wasn't a proper album. Slade was the only real album I had, and 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 actually the next album I bought after that was Nevermind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols. Five years later, well, the first time I heard them, I was at school, and I was stood outside the swimming pool. We were queuing up to go in the swimming pool with school, and there was a lad in class called Mark Chivers from London, or rather. I don't really know the full story of his family situation, but his dad lived in London and his dad was, I think, as I remember it, his dad was some kind of vicar or priest or something. And he'd gone to stay with his dad that summer. So he came back from London and he was telling us in the queue about this group called the Sex Pistols that the singer did handstands and vomited on stage. And this sounded incredibly exciting. <clears throat> I've never been able to verify that either of these things ever happened. You know, I think the vomiting is at least plausible. Maybe it happened once. Handstands, can't really see that. I can't see Johnny Rotten or John Lydon as now doing handstands on stage. No, I'm not having that. I think it, I don't know. I doubt very much that he'd seen them. I suspect he'd, this, he'd probably heard this about sixth hand or something. But it was obvious that there was something going on. The other thing I remember is... He suddenly arrived in school with his. He'd cut his hair like sort of Sid Vicious's. He had he had a fantastic Sid Vicious haircut actually, and would actually stand out in the rain, giggling while in in the pouring rain to make his hair look better. And but he he suddenly turned up on this top, and they had Mark Mutilation written on the back of it. So he'd become a punk. Um, so it was quite exciting, really. That what yeah, there was obviously something going on, even though I wasn't quite sure what it was. And then the same boy brought in i mean this must i can't it's, the timeline sort of confuses me a bit and I'm, i think the first incident must have been in 1976 and then probably it must have been a few months later that he he brought in anarchy in the uk which i i would believe would have been i it could have even even been the a&m or or, or well, the f uh, first early early version of it or something but i think it was yeah it was anarchy in the uk and he played it in the music class and because we were allowed to play our own records at the end. The, the teacher would make us listen to Elgar and Beethoven and things like that. And then right at the end, we were allowed to put on our own records. So I would put on, oh God, probably something like uh, Mississippi by a Dutch band called Pussycat that was number one for about 11 years, or it felt like it. Um, that, <laughs> that was, I think that was the last record I bought before Punk. And then... Chivsy bought in Anarchy in the UK and put it on, and it was like, what the heck is this? It sounded incredible. I, I, the lyrics didn't register at all. It was the chord change. It was something about that descending. Oh, I, I think it's, I'm not a guitarist, but it's some, the, the, something about the chord changes of it and the the pattern of it and and the excitement of it. I just thought, what the heck is this? And within, again, I'm, I'm not quite clear on the timing, but it it felt very sudden that suddenly there were about half a dozen of us at school that would go into a little room with a red light and we would listen to stuff like In the City by the Jam, uh, Looking After Number One by the Boomtown Rats, who are not really seen as a cool punk group now, but at the time they were part of our early in educate, you know, in, in in initiation, I suppose, into punk. And me and another lad called uh, Richard Breakspear, I think his name was, that we all started doing things with our hair, you know, like cutting our hair and... Uh, sort of making trying to get trying to make it go up a bit you know there was a lot a, a friend of mine was from nigeria and it, he used to have a you know kind of small afro and he had this like sheep's lanolin and i said tayo can i borrow some of that you know and he would lend me this stuff and sort of put my hair up a bit you know and uh, of course we thought this was tremendously exciting but then we three of us went to see the jam 
uh, and we didn't realize that you needed tickets to get in. You couldn't just sort of rock up. You know, we, I think we'd assume that you could. I mean, we were so naive and so young. This is like 13 years old or something, 12, 13 years old. We, as I remember it, we just didn't even realize that you would need tickets. So we get down there and we haven't got tickets. And there's this massive queue of people. We've gone, you know, looking kind of punky. We'd sort of cut up our uniforms and put ink and stuff on stuff. And we thought we looked punky. And they just laughed at us, you know, because all the crowd are there in, like, you know, cardigans and flares with long hair. They were not punks. They were hippies. You know, I don't think punk had really got far from London back at that point. And so we never got into the gig, but we did make it into the sound check for at least 30 seconds. Uh, and I can vividly remember the sight of the shoes. I said, there were Paul Weller and Bruce Function. I remember the shoes. And then suddenly we were being thrown out, you know, and there was a policeman outside asking us where what we were doing and all the rest of it, you know. It was quite nice, actually, the policeman. You know, it, it wasn't exactly, uh, you know, a clash with authority. It was quite friendly. He <laughs> just asked us what, what on earth we were doing, you know. And we said, well, we tried to get in because we haven't got tickets. So I failed, I failed miserably to see any of the, you know, punk bands at that. I was too young, really. Um, and then I do vividly remember Christmas 1970, it must have been Christmas 77, um, an advert in the Yorkshire Evening Post for the Sex Pistols at Huddersfield, Ivanhoe's, I, I now know, I don't remember it as being Ivanhoe's, but I remember it being Huddersfield, and saying to my mum, mum, can I go to this, you know, and she was like, don't be ridiculous, you know, you know there's no way you are going it was in it was in another town, you know. It was it well, it wasn't even in like, Leeds, you know. It, it would have been a real di- journey, and I was just not allowed to do it. And annoyingly, when I when I you know I didn't I I didn't really I don't think I knew this at the time, but they did two shows. They did a matinee show for under fourteens, I think it was, and then a sort of adult show. And and so the matinee show in the afternoon, I can't. I, I think I could have gone to that, you know, if I'd have known it was in the afternoon, or if I'd have worked it out. Maybe my mum would have let me because we didn't have a car or anything you know I'd have, I would have had to get a bus a train then another train then a, probably a bus you know it was it would have been there's no way my mum was going to let me do that really you um, you mentioned that that for your father's death music was a way of sort of coming to terms or understanding uh that and yeah, then being I, a teenager I remember I'm a little bit older than you I think so for me Bowie was the yeah, uh, the big idol, 72, 73. Yeah. But he provided um, a world which I felt I wanted to get into rather than yeah. the world I was in. Was that yeah. the same for you musically then? I think so. I mean, it's funny, Bowie, I did buy, the first Bowie record I bought was the, there was a reissue of Space Oddity, which must have been about 74, 75, 76. I'm not sure, but mid 70s, it came out again. It already, you know, it'd been out a few years earlier and been a, a hit, I think, but it was a hit again. Um, and I bought that and it had Velvet Goldmine and Changes on the B side. And I, I actually like the B side more than the A side. I used to play those two songs all the time. And, I, and when I look at it, those two songs are kind of, especially Velvet Goldmine. Velvet Goldmine's not that different to punk, really. It's got, it's kind of, edging its way towards a punkier sound um and i also i vividly remember going into tony the barbers in horse of town street with my mate cameron and, and my mate paul and we all said mister can we have a bowie please and we wanted the bowie haircut and this is like this must have been about 74 um it was when he was kind of ziggy period or maybe actually probably a lad insane period by then you know and i had red hair i was a natural redhead so you know, when to see some a pop star with red hair after being taunted for, you know, Ginger Nut and Joracell and all these kind of things, to suddenly see the probably the coolest man in pop at that time, a red haired guy, you know, even though it was dyed, you know, I'm like, yes, you know, so I want it to look like David Bowie. And I've still got pictures of the results of, of what, what happened when I came out of the barbers and I look like a kind of deranged Elvis. <laughs> you know, my, my hair wouldn't go. It just it couldn't get it to go like Cameron and Paul had this super spiky Bowie mullets, you know. And I came out with this kind of weird quiff thing. And uh, my mum's like, what have you done at your hair? You know, the first of many, many hairstyle horrors to come, unfortunately, like my poor mum. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted in. I did want in, even though I, was, I, I wasn't cool enough. I couldn't quite hack it, really. But I had, you know, I got high waistband trousers and stuff like that, you know. I remember having a Bowie haircut. And one morning, I, I a Ziggy Stardust haircut, one morning I went to school and then, and a sort of mile from my home at the next stop where this other school 
children where they, where they got on, suddenly they all shouted out Linda McCartney and I was completely gutted because <laughs> I thought I was David Bowie. Yeah, Anyhow. that's the sort of thing. <laughs> Let's it's get to fun. the book. Let's get to the book because okay. um, the book appears in a way, it's a bit like a fanzine, you know, in, in its look. Um, I guess it is, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I should say, I had nothing to do with the design whatsoever. I left it to people who do these things much better than I would. So, uh, yeah, I suppose it does a bit, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think one of the great things about it is it's sort of it's got this sort of timeless aspect to it because of that and also yeah. because of the photographs. But tell me, how did yeah. the book actually come about in the first place? The book came about... It's a, it's all a bit of a blur. Like <laughs> You probably realise that a lot of my life is like this. Um, and I try and piece it together. I think, when did that happen? And then when did this happen? And, but it was probably, I think, about May of 2021. And I got a phone call. Actually, it might have been initially a Facebook message, but I remember speaking on the phone to one of my mates, who was a, another journalist, another music journalist that I've known for years. And he said, would, would you be interested in writing a Pistols book? You know, and I'm like, um, I don't know. What, 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 why? You know, and... And I'm still not entirely sure. I'll, next time I speak to him, I'll have to ask him. What, what, it was either he he was supposed to do it and didn't have the time and, and so needed somebody else to take it on, or he was acting as a sort of intermediary for the publisher. And I'm not actually sure. I can't remember <laughs> what the, what was said at that, because it's all a blur of that conversation. But, but for whatever, you know, basically the deal was... It needed to be done by October. I think it was October the 31st. And I'm thinking, well, hang on. My previous two books, The Fallen and The Last Champions, both took two years each. Um, so you want me to do a book in, what, five months? You know, and but it was a, it was or and is a third of the of the length of either of those two books. So I'm thinking, OK, so I did 90,000 words for The Fallen or maybe, actually, it might be even more than that in two years. I did the last champions probably a hundred and something thousand in about that same time. So you start doing the maths, you know. You think, okay, five months—that's quite a tall order, you know. Um, and I quickly realised I wouldn't have done what I did with both those books. Um, the Fallen was—it talks to all the well, most of the people that ever played in the Fall, and I tracked them all down. You know, about forty-five or fifty of them in the end, and that took a long time. And I, you know, I interviewed them all. At some, in some cases, I went all over the place with, with the last champions. I even went to Los Angeles to speak to Vic, Vinnie Jones for that book. And I realised I thought I can't. I'm not going to be able to do that in the time period with 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 the amount of people I would like to speak to, to the, for the Pistols book. However, I realised I was sitting on a big archive of. I've been interviewing people in and around punk for twenty years, you know, and. I've interviewed John Lydon, well, Rotten as, you know, Johnny Rotten twice. Um, people like Jar Wobble, I'd, I'd interviewed Glenn Matlock, I, uh, Jimmy Percy, lots of the people are in and around that scene. And I had loads of this stuff, you know, unused quotes, some used, some some not, some tapes in the garage, some on MP3s. And I thought, I've got quite a lot of stuff there. Um, and I thought, right, I'll see what I've got, and then I'll see what I need, you know. And I kind of basically just thought, I'm going to do this. I will. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to do it. And actually, I really, really enjoyed it. And what I decided to do, I thought, well, given the, I mean, I, I suppose ideally, I would have loved two or three years to track down hundreds of people. But in the time period, I thought, right, what I really want is one or two people who've never spoken before, or or who've not really spoken properly, that are quite key to the story. So I got a couple of those. I mean, I had a fan, fascinating chat with. Andrew Logan, who's quite a you know a, a sort of you know well known artist, sculpture used to do the alternative Mid Miss World, a real character. He put on the Pistol Second Ever gig, um, and there's very little about it anywhere. And I thought, you know, I've got to ask him stuff. And we had a fantastic conversation, and he was hilarious and really giving and remembered. You know, it, it, we like it's a bit like me. There's some things he just didn't remember at all about it, and other things he could remember in really great detail. Um, and then also, I wanted to find people that had seen them because I've been fascinated. I mean, I live in Yorkshire, and I'm fascinated by the fact that they played the Ford Green Pub in Leeds and Knickers Club in Keighley, and a place in North Allerton, which is only like half an hour from me. And they played in Scarborough and places like this and Penzance. And I thought. I'll find a few people that went to those gigs and saw them playing, you know, under assumed names a lot of the time. 
playing to 30 people. What's it like? You know, what is it like when you see, you know, the one of the most controversial bands in British pop history in a pub in Whitby or somewhere? You know, I, I just had to find two or three of those people and they didn't disappoint, you know, and it it, it placed it in context, really, because I think this is the thing that it's probably hard for people now to get their head round because nowadays a band like the pistols, if they came along, they would be everywhere. You know, there'd be such a media thing. There'd be a blitz of, of interest. There'd be all on lo lots of online stuff. Everything would go viral. There'd be loads of people wanting to get into the gigs in the seventies. It wasn't like that. You know, I mean, in our school, there were probably six or seven punks tops, you know, everyone else was into queen or whatever. Um, and then... But also, I think when you say context, I think the context, the political and social context of the era is yeah. pretty important. So, I mean, could you tell me about that, that what it was like during that era before they really sort of kicked in? Well, this is the thing. I mean, I think this is why the pistol spoke to me as a teenager. Well, barely a teenager, you know. Really, I was. I was. I think when they when they formed, I would. If they formed in 1975, I would have been about 11. Um, Actually, not even that. Yeah, about yeah, about eleven, just eleven, twelve. So, a very young child, but feeling, I can remember, and I still kind of feel like this. I I felt annoyed at stuff. You know, I didn't like the way the world was. I didn't like the fact that my dad had died. I didn't like the fact that we didn't have a lot of money. Um, other people lived in nicer houses, <laughs> and you would see them on the school route, and you think. Why is the world like this? You know, why is it so unfair? Why is there no natural justice in around on anything? And I was starting to become politically aware, but probably not in a detail way. But I was becoming, I used to, I'd started to watch the news and I used to see stuff like, you know, litter piling up in the streets and strikes. And it felt pretty crap, really. You know, my life didn't feel fantastic in the, at that period. And I think really the the Sex Pistols and bands like the Sex Pistols, Joy Division was another one a little bit later on, really con connected with a sense that I had of frustration and that it was not all it cracked up to be. And I remember a kid at school saying, quoting that lyric from God Save the Queen, you know, where where the where the flowers in your dustbin, and and saying that's exactly how it feels, isn't it? That's exactly how we feel. And I heard, I remember hearing that and thinking. It is. That is exactly how we feel. We felt like we'd been, as a generation, kind of let down a little bit. Um, that it had been great in the fifties and sixties for young people, and by the late seventies, it was everything was. You know, I remember Britain as a black and white monochrome grey place, and I remember being very poor, and it was just no fun. You know, we, we made our own fun, and so you do stuff like play on an upturned Mini Cooper and cut your leg. You know, I remember things like that. <laughs> Climb the local trees. And I and I kind of liked all that. I did like that. But, yeah, it, we, we were... I think a lot of us felt frustrated. And so when Punk came along, it was an outlet for that. And it you, you just thought, finally, you know, these people understand how we... You know, I, I, re, I thought, perhaps naively, really, but that if somebody had drainpipe jeans and spiky hair, they were like me and they understood how I felt and they and their record, the music that they made would understand how I felt. And I think we all felt a bit like that, really. It just really resonated with kids and, you know, young people. Um, and at the same time, and when I started researching the book and, you know, I, it brought back memories. I, I do remember seeing stuff in the newspapers about these outrageous punk rockers, you know, and... That how horrible they were and all the rest of it and and I'm thinking no they're not that these are the good people you know you're these are the people who are going to change the world um you're the you know you're the you're the reactionary forces you know where, and that really resonating with me and it's yeah it's funny looking back but when I started digging into it and you find these kind of quotes from people in the houses of parliament or councillors or whatever you know about these outrageous appalling punk rockers who deserve to be buried under the ground you know it re really negative stuff um it was a re it, you know the, it, it reminded me of that sort of sense of us and them i had i mean i i remember a song it, again a couple of years later but there was a song on the metal box album by public image called uh the suit and it was about some you know a, a kind of archetypal businessman you know i am i am the suit you know this is my nature and i used to see people in suits as the enemy you know i thought they were 
everything I I hated, everything I didn't want to be. I did not want to, you know. I think my career path from some of my family, they'd have been quite happy if I if I if I'd followed my dad into the civil service and he was, you know, he was a tax collector for the revenue. And, you know, I, I mean, that I, that job got him a council house. It didn't exactly set him up for life. I don't know how much he enjoyed it. I, I would love to know. You know, he had some lovely workmates there because I've seen the pictures. But, you know, I just thought I don't really want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want a, a job behind a desk. I don't, I don't want to be stuck in a suit. So it was everything I didn't like. And so punk just, you know, spoke to that sense of polarization from <laughs> society, I suppose, you know. Yeah, a lot of people sort of romanticize about a yeah. younger era. But when people talk to me about like the late 70s, early 80s, or the 70s and 80s, I always say that well, the, the things that were really around them were homophobia, racism, misogyny. Yeah, you know, they were, it, yeah. it was a really pretty evil time. I it think. was an evil time. It was. I mean, that you know, again, slightly later on, but around eighty three, I and I went, by the time I'd have been, in, you know, just about old enough to get into pubs, I remember that was when the Falklands War was all kicking off, and me, me and my mate would sit on the up, upstairs bus of the bus coming up, coming back from Leeds City Centre on a Friday or Saturday, and there'd be people like, "Why aren't you in the Falklands? Why aren't you over there with our boys and all this stuff?" You know, and I thought, well, I'm not, I, I, you know. I'd rather listen to Echo and the Bunny Man. Thanks very much. I'm not so, a part of this, and so I, hate, I hated it. And, and I still, you know, it's it's funny because talking about it now, I don't feel that differently now. I I I haven't really lost that sense of uh, you know indignation at a lot of things that go 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 on. And yeah, I mean, I, I got into the Gang of Four, the Clash, and they started opening my eyes to politics. You know, and. And a, and a different way of thinking, I think, really. A different way of thinking. There was a brilliant line in a Gang of Four song. Um, we all have opinions. Where do they come from? And it was actually a line from a feminist pamphlet that Andy Gill from the Gang of Four had found somewhere near, near Leeds University. But that really hit home, you know, and I thought, that's so true. Because, for example, my mom, bless her, you know, she would say, oh, the flipping IRA, you know, because the IRA bombings were on the news a lot. And, and she was very anti the IRA and... But you start to realise it, it's not as black and white as that. There's, these are very complex situations and it's not as simple as good and bad or black and white. And, you know, you, you get real, you get you just find that the world is a lot more nuanced and you, you're obviously your mind's starting to change at that point. And the clash got me into reggae music and, you know, listening to different forms of music and so that my, my, you know i was opening my mind in that way really it was a, i mean in, you know in, in some ways it was an awful time it was a bleak time but equally i have to say the excitement of discovering new music was just it, it just felt incredible and the first real real well the first gig i went to apart from the jam sound check incident was future armor in leeds which was 1979 headlined by public image and the only reason i went to that was because i wanted to see johnny ron you know, I was still quite young then, and and I went to that. You know, it was on a Saturday. So I had to get the, I had to finish early from my Saturday job, and it was just like one after another band blowing my mind. You know, Cabaret Voltaire with all their weird synthesizer music, a certain ratio with their punky funk stuff, um, Punishment of Luxury, fi theatrical post punk new wave, just one band after another. Orchestra Maneuvers in the Dark with, I think the first band I saw actually that sounded like the magic roundabout theme from outer space and it was just like one one after another and all these people around me all of the who were older than me and my friend all of who looked cooler than we were I had an iron on Sid Vicious t-shirt when I went to that gig it was never worn again um I changed everything changed overnight I went to seen and heard records in Leeds and bought Joy Division's transmission single on the Monday morning and yeah everything changed everything changed and that that moment it, it all crystallized because punk was about this kind of rage thing, really, um, or frustration. And then suddenly, Future Armor was about possibility, and the two things kind of dovetailed and to totally changed my life, really. So, you know, back to the book, and the first chapter is basically this interview with Bill Grundy, who had a Today <laughs> program, which is this infamous yeah. interview, and anyone yeah. in, in Britain will know it completely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it does sort of, because of the context of the time, which you sort of mentioned, it sort of in that context, when you when you read it in that context, you can see a little bit 
where the reaction came from. Today, it's a bit odd to read that. Can you tell me about that interview and why you decided that that should open the book? I think because it just sums it up. It, in, in, I mean, that was the moment that they went from being a, you know, I suppose a, a cult thing in London, known by a small handful, to front page news and a national outrage, you know, overnight because of that programme. I didn't see the program because it, we wouldn't have got it where where I live. But I do remember it being on the front page. I remember the front pages, uh, you know, the next day when it all kicked off, the filth and the fury and all this, you know. I do remember that. But it just sort of, watching it now, it sums up the, the sense of them and us and the sense of that something had arrived it, that the establishment or the media didn't know how to, to tackle. They'd never had anything like this before. And you really get a sense of that when you look at the Bill Grundy programme, because, you know, the interviewer, Bill Grundy, is clearly sort of slightly bemused by this this phenomenon around him, slightly, in, you know, possibly slightly intimidated by it and slightly scornful, you know. And so he's kind of trying to find ways of almost like putting them down, really. And it, and it becomes this confrontation between almost like the old and the new, you know, and I love that about it. I love the fact that, you know, they went on there and however long that clip was, it's not that long, it's only a few minutes, you know, and, and in those few minutes, change everything. They changed their lives. They changed Bill Grundy's life, who never really worked in television again. Um, they changed the media narrative and they changed you know, the minds of so many young people and, and, and just created this ripple that is still spreading. And it, in a way, it all starts with that, that appearance. Has there ever been an entrance like that by a band anywhere near comparable? Because when I read that, I thought, mm. oh, God, that is, you know, I mean, I forgot how wild yeah. the reaction was. Yeah, and uh, how explosive the reaction was, and then with yeah. you know everybody, you know them getting banned from yeah. radio stations, from everything. Every was so over the top, yeah. and at the same time, as being someone of a younger generation back then, it was immediately something. Oh wow, this is this is fantastic. You know, absolutely. Is... I mean, the only the only thing I can compare it to, and I I wasn't there, but. You know, I've read about and I've I've seen the clips of Elvis. You know, when when Elvis was first broadcast on American television, and it caused such outrage across the nation that you know that it, they 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 banned him from being filmed from the waist down because below the waist would cause such damage to society and and the fabric of the nation and and the and the minds of the nation's youth that it wasn't allowed to to show it from the waist. And that's the only thing that I think is comparable, really. And but certainly nothing in my lifetime has been comparable to, to 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 that. You know, it's you know, there's been sort of a sort of similar thing like Huggy Bear on the Word springs to mind, and you know, the Stone Roses on on um, the Late Show in in I think it must have been about 1989 or 1990 when they they blow the power and everything, and that's that was quite a moment. But yeah, nothing. You know, the the Bill Grundy, and certainly in my lifetime, it is the, it's the top of the tree in terms of instant impact and instant outrage amazing really how unlikely do you think the members of the original you know the the first members of the sex pistols were to be a band how unlikely was that from their well, backgrounds this is, this is the other side of it and there's a great quote that that jo, uh, john wardle aka jar wobble told me a, a few years ago that i put in the book um that you know when he said I think when Johnny Rotten, his, his friend John, had, had basically said, you know, I'm, I'm I'm joining this band. And Wobble said that, you know, for us, it was as, as likely as flying a 747 that you would be in a band. <laughs> and when you look at the original four pistols, and arguably Sid Vicious, the, you know, the fifth member, as it were, or the, you know, the, the first in, um, after 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 the departure, the first lineup change, well, the only lineup change, really, but, but arguably Sid as well. These were none of these people were people that you would have expected to be in a band. Steve Jones and I love Steve Jones's book, and that had a big impact on me writing this. I thought he 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 really captures a lot of that sense that you know he was a miscreant, he was a thief, he was a real you know a ne'er do well as my mum mum might have called him. Um, you know he was he stole the equipment from you know the 
this various gigs and everything. He was not a person you would expect to form a band at a time when bands meant musicianship and proficiency and you know virtuoso guitar playing and solos that went on for five years. You know that. Rotten himself, you know, he'd had a terrible childhood with meningitis and a coma and all the rest of it and had to educate himself, probably virtually unemployable otherwise, um, apart from being the singer in the Sex Pistols, for which he was completely brilliantly qualified. Um, Paul Cook was, a, you know, a, probably the most regular of the band in, in some ways. He, he had a steady job um, working as a, a sort of electrician. Um but gave that up for the band. He, you know, he was possibly, you know, I guess working class kids from reasonably stable backgrounds did go into bands. And Cook, Cookie and Glenn Matlock, I think, had slightly more stable backgrounds than the other two. Um, but but really, bands weren't, they didn't look like that in 1976 and 77. They didn't, certainly didn't sound like that. Um, you know, they, they weren't brilliantly proficient. However, you know, Paul Cook was a, a really good drummer in a, in for the Sex Pistols. You know, and and he's still he's be, you know become quite a good a, a in demand session drummer in the in, in the end. But and Steve Jones had a very very influential and distinctive sound. And you know, even though it, it might not have been as technically proficient as you know the people that you'd see on top of the pops every week, and uh, you know the sort of virtuoso prog rock guitar heroes, etc. But it was a very exciting sound and. Yeah, that maybe that's all you need, you know. Well, obviously, you know, and also McLaren, Malcolm McLaren, but he he was sort of distinct in age, and in the type of person he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he. Th this is another thing that I suppose I slightly wanted to kind of not set the record straight, but kind of just clarify and bring a few things together. There is a consensus, or a common well, not a consensus, but a common view that the pistols were somehow manufactured by McLaren as this evil Svengali who would rip off the record business. It's not really like that. Um, for a start, the, the, you know, the, they were, the bulk of the band were together before, me, before they met McLaren. You know, the first Sex Pistol really was a guy called Wally Nightingale, who's, who's you know, been sort of forgotten in the mist of history. But it was, it was him that started the band that Steve Jones and Paul Cook and then eventually Glenn, Glenn Matlock got, got going. They weren't called the Sex Pistols. They were, well, they had various names, but they were called Swankers uh, for a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have quite the same ring of it. But, you know, it, McLaren sort of, he didn't, didn't put it together. He sort you know, they he, he got, he, they started going in his shop basically and then he realized that they could you know they could be a band and or they well they were a band but they could be more and you know they needed a front man they needed a front man and, and Lyde and Johnny Rotten as 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 would be had started going in the shop so it, was all, it wasn't really planned and the other thing which is really striking is that for all the controversy when the the Grundy incident first went off. Malcolm McLaren was terrified. It was like, what the heck have we done? What have we done? You know, this will be the end of us. And it was only, you know, it was like a few hours later or, or the next day, really, he started to realise, oh, actually, no, this could be a good thing. Controversy. But they'd not deliberately gone out to be controversial. It wasn't like they were going to plan this. You know, the, the Bill Grundy incident was not planned. It wasn't like we're going to go on and we're going to, outrage the nation and and land on the front pages. It, it was a kind of accident, really, that that happened. And Steve Jones actually says it was the worst thing that could happen to the group because it changed, you know, from that moment, they were public enemy number one and in the spotlight. So they never, they weren't allowed to develop naturally in the way that a group would have done. And that's the, that fascinates me. What would have happened had, that, had the pistols gone that way? Would they have made 10 albums? We've no idea. We'll never know. But but for whatever reason, the the, the well, for the Grundy reason, it all changed, and suddenly they were in the focus, in the spotlight, and everyone would have an opinion of, of on them forever. Then you know, very you know, nobody has an as an as a kind of you know, you either love or the hate, or you hate the Sex Pistols. Certainly in in, in nineteen seventy seven, it was polarized. You know, you, you nobody was in the middle. <laughs> Ultimate <laughs> I mean, one thing you've already touched on about them playing and and people going to their gigs and then changing their life, but. What really comes across in the book is all these fledgling future rock and pop stars, or whatever you want to call them, who yeah. are at their gigs, yeah. and suddenly it changed their life. Can you tell me I about know. that? I find that incredible. And 
it's funny, even since I wrote the book, I've interviewed more people that have said, you know, oh, I saw the Sex Pistols in 1977 and it changed my, you know, Martin Fry from ABC was one of them. And you think, well, hang on, how do you go from never mind the bollocks to the look of love? You know, it, it seems poles apart. But that was the great thing that they did was they, they convinced a lot of working class, especially working class kids up and down the country, we can do this. We can form a band. You know, we can be, we can, we can do it. We we don't have to sound like that. We can do our, do it our way. And so ABC would develop. Um, Green Gart side from Scritti Politi, another band who don't really sound anything like the Sex Pistols, saw the gig at Leeds Polytechnic, um, and and literally, it, you know, he he, he, he well, it told me it changed his life. You know, it was it was it, it just never was the same again. And he knew what he wanted to do from that moment on. There's loads of them, you know. Joy Division were at the, the well, the Manchester, the two Manchester gigs, is pretty much a who's who of music in Manchester. That the people that attended those two gigs, you know, every sort of everybody from Joy Division to Mick Hucknall was at that, or one of the two Manchester gigs. Um, obviously, the Buzzcocks uh, supported them at the second, and they put on, they promoted the first gig. Because Howard Devoto and Pete Shelley, uh, uh, you know, before, well, Pete McNeish and Howard Trafford, as they were then called, um, saw them in High, in High Wycombe and said to Malcolm McLaren, could could we put your band on in Manchester? You know, so they bring the pistols up to Manchester and that starts punk in Manchester, really, that gate the first time at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. And it's just all these like ripples, really. And... I love the fact that you know people like Polystyrene saw them playing under under the pier at H Hastings on or, or, or rather on the pier at H in in Hastings with about you know 20, 30 people watching and she forms X ray specs. Um Penetration from County Durham saw them at North Allerton um in, in one of the tiny little gigs and they form they form penetration. You know, it's just it's it, it feels like you know, there's that story about I think it was Brian Eno had that quote about the Velvet Underground, you know, that they didn't sell many records, but everyone who bought one formed a seminal band or some some something like that. It it feels a little bit like that with the pistols. That certainly at the start, a lot of people that saw them had their lives completely transformed by it. And I think those ripples carry on, you know, not just in music. You know, people like Damien Damien Hurst is a big Sex Pistols fan. Um, so that's the art world, you know. Kerry McCarthy, the MP for I think Bristol, one of the, one of the Bristol constituencies, is is a is a punk and Sex Pistols fan, and you know it, it's just all these tentacles, you know, going to all these different areas, and I, I love that. I mean, you mentioned that they're working class, and what I never really thought of it before, and it's in the book that their contemporaries in America were middle class. Yeah, I got I, I did a I did a talk a couple of weeks ago, and. I got a kind of question I didn't really expect it really about you know American punk and British punk, and you know what did did the Americans start punk and and I thought heck I didn't see that one coming and I hadn't I wasn't even sure if I'd ever really thought of it before, but how I how I explained it or how I, my view of it really is that I don't see them as the same things. I don't see British punk has a lot in common with American punk. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the the American bands were that did tend to be more middle class, um, but also I think they had different concerns and a different sound. I mean, I, one of the first records I bought actually was uh, Blank Gen the twelve inch of Blank Generation by Richard Hell and the Voidoids, and I bought that purely on the strength of the picture on the cover, which is Richard Hell with a fantastic kind of punky spiky haircut, and his eyes are cut out. It looks really it just looks punky really to a 13 year old it's like i'm having I'm, I'm gonna buy that i had no idea i didn't know they were american i didn't know anything about them i just bought the 12 inch and i got it home and i thought oh doesn't really sound very punk this <laughs> it doesn't sound punk at all i did really like it and i love the idea of a blank generation you know that i suppose that that possibly could have been a british punk song that in the title but the music didn't sound punk at all and yeah, I don't really see the see the, the that much in common in, in a way. I mean, I love the Ramones, and I saw the Ramones when I was I'll have been about sixteen, I think, and they, it was one of the best gigs I saw in that period. I remember coming home drenched in sweat, you know. But were were the Ramones punk? Not in the way not in the way that we understand it over here, you know. It's certainly got that same energy, you know, but and short songs and all the rest of it and leather jackets, but. 
not quite in the same way that we understand punk. You know, there, there's not a lot in common between, you know, the you know if you look at television, talking heads, Patty Smith, Ramones, and and stuff like the Pistols and X-ray specs, etc. You know, there, there's, there's 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 an overlap, but they are there's a, they're, they're quite different in a lot of ways. And maybe maybe the class thing is part of it. You know, maybe it is. You know, I think maybe the British version was a little bit more of a rudimentary whale, you know. <laughs> I was talking to Kevin Heggie the other week, who's a documentary maker, and he made that um, fantastic documentary, uh, New Romantics. Um, and he was also talking about Andrew Logan. Yeah. And, and the Sex Pistols playing. And Andrew Logan, of course, did the alternative, was it Miss Universe or Miss World? Alternative, alternative Miss World. Yeah, the alternative Miss World at that, that yeah. time. Why was that such a, a pivotal appearance for the Sex Pistols? I think because it was there was a lot of people at that gig that, that were kind of movers and shakers and things like that. And I think Andrew Logan's parties were quite, notorious and memorable for that you know they would attract a lot of the kind of arty people in 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 london and you know real characters um so for them to be part of that scene gives them a sort of arty kind of context that maybe they wouldn't have, have, have normally been exposed to and I, th- I think also just the, the fact that it was it was a valentine's day ball put on in a like a an art an art installation type space, um, not the kind of place you would normally get a rock band, you know. And I think by putting them in an unusual place, it kind of gives them a different context, you know. Um, I mean, pu- arguably, Public Image Limited took that on because they started really expanding the ideas of what a rock band is and and what you know, even what records are. You know, they put out three twelve inches in a tin, you know, and they had this idea that they they would be a, a limited company with different members, you know, and then they were really playing around with the idea of what a band was. And I think maybe Andrew Logan's world maybe sowed some of that seed, you know, because it was a very different world to, to where they would have come from, you know, which would have been pubs and, you know, record shops maybe. I mean, you 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 mentioned, in you know, in the book that they're, that they're banned, uh, they're vilified, in the press, they're obviously loved by a certain section of society at the same yeah. time. They're banned from gigging, you know, yeah. there's threats all over the place. Yeah. And then there are the internal conflicts within yeah. the band. What 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 do you think the actual beginning of the end was? What was it because of the internal conflicts or was it the outside influence on it, them? It's kind of both, and I think they're fed into each other. I, I mean I suppose the internal conflicts, Cook and Jones go went back a long way. They were childhood mates. You know, they ha- they hung around together. They knew each other very, very well. Glenn Matlock was the only one of the band who went to a grammar school. So he was a slightly different, and he m- had a much more stable background from Co- than, than Cook and Jones. And he, he had much more of a kind of, you know, musical, pro- probably breadth of his vocabulary was a bit a bit broader musically. He wasn't really quite like them. Um, and nor was Jock, nor was Lydon, you know. Um, so they were quite different characters. So I think it's always different. I mean, you know, I think in a in any band, it's very hard to find people that don't just gel musically, but gel as people. And to keep that together is probably the hardest p- part of it. It's very difficult, I think when you're not very successful because people get frustrated you know why why aren't we playing there why aren't we in this magazine and and then when success comes it brings other pressures why is the front man always on the front of the magazine why is it always this why are they always interview the singer you know you get all these different pressures build up in bands so you've got all those normal pressures and then you've got the the relentlessness of what what it must have been like to be the in the pistols in that kind of public eye, all those things you mentioned, and to for Cook and Jones, they would have loved to tour and play gigs, and suddenly they're not allowed to play gigs. You know, they're banned from everywhere. That would have been frustrating, um, and they would get attacked. You know, they got most of the band got attacked in the street at one point or another. You know, quite severely. 
so they were getting all these kind of things you know that would just exaggerate any pro- any kind of problems so the first real fault line that went was was matlock you know Mat- matlock was becoming more and more alienated i think from the rest of the band and especially rotten you know they, they, they there was a big conflict there between the two of them um so he basically was the first one who you know he wanted out really um and was getting more and more frustrated with it so then they're getting sid who you know bless him was not a stable enough person to cope with any well i don't know if if sid vicious was that would have really been the right person to get in many groups at all but certainly not a band as volatile and as in the eye of the storm as the pistols were and with all the problems that resulted as a result you know i mean wobble described sid vicious as a very damaged boy you know he'd got he'd been he'd, 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 he was with him when they went to see he was sid vicious was te- sent to see a sort of psychiatrist you know and and you know, they, they were sort of joking about suicide and stuff like that, you know, and, and you know, it was, it, it's, but really, it wasn't that much of a joke for Sid. It probably was for, for Wobble because he wasn't really suicidal, but, but Sid was, or certainly had the, he had that kind of nihilistic darkness in him. Um, and he went down to, down, down some dark paths. And then, and then you've, you've got that person in the band not very proficient musically, you know, could never really play the bass. They did try to get him, you know, they, Lemmy tried to teach him at one point, but um, was ob- obviously very iconic visually for the band, but a- again became a target of various things. And it, it just, I don't know, I don't think any band would have survived in that environment. I just don't know how you could have done, you know, because it's not, it's hard enough being in a band and all the pressures of rehearsing and playing gigs and being into it, all those kind of things that normally go in a band. But if you've got all that with this constant negativity and constant stuff like being banned and, you know, being attacked, et cetera, it, 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 it I just don't know how you would hold it together. It's in a way it's a miracle it lasted as long as the day, you know, yeah, I mean, you mentioned Sid Vicious's troubled history. Uh, I mean, yeah. his mother was a heroin addict. Yeah. Um, you then, yeah. of course, he's going out with Nancy Spungen, who's sort of um, aligned, in a sense, by lots of people to Yoko Ono as the, the, the you know, the person that the brought wicked down the band. The yeah, the Wicked yeah. Witch of the West, which yeah. I don't necessarily think is uh, all true because it was already happening. Oh. So, I don't so I mean, I, I think she was certainly a very, you know, nihilistic pr- person herself, and I mean, her mother's book that you know i don't want to live this life you know that's the title of the book and seems to sum up you know there was some you know she was clearly very damaged and they and they bonded together because of that um you know and and it does seem to be that when she came on the scene that things with sid went downhill rapidly you know in terms of heroin and stuff like that um it's a it's a real shame you know because you know it is he's the he's the human tragedy at the core of this thing you know um, and I think, you know, a lot of the people around feel very guilty or bad about what happened to Sid, really. You know, whether he would, it, it might have happened to him anyway, but it probably just sped it up a bit. Who, but we'll never know. I mean, um, I was talking the other day about uh, Joy Division to someone, and we were talking about the fact that when Ian Curtis died, or the fact that he died, sort of added to the legacy because they had a limited amount of uh, yeah. material that was out. How do you see the legacy of the the Sex Pistols in relation to the end of the band, which you you sort of put in the book as the San Francisco gig, yeah. um, and the fact that they could be no more? Well, I wanted I wanted to to stop the book at that moment. I didn't want to go into the various reunions and all the rest of it. I, so I stopped the book when the band end, and then when Sid dies, you know not that long afterwards so those are the two real instances that bring the curtain down i think at the time the mythology around sid vicious was very very powerful and very strong and then you know you'd get these i remember seeing badges in leeds market you know sid vicious too fast to live too young to die and stuff like that and it, it, he had that james dean status that ian curtis then then had well you know a young death it seems to be very romantic and very appealing to a lot of people I think that's gradually faded, really. I don't think that's as big a part of the um, the mythology of the Pistols now as it would have been at the time. 
Um, I think really ultimately that you know, and it's the same for Joy Division. You know that what what really makes them last is the impact on people and the body of work. And the Pistols let, let left a fairly small body of work, certainly in the the original. You know, not there's various compilations reissues, but the actual pub output at the time was pretty tiny in terms of a handful of singles and one record, one album. Um, but they're all fantastic and they made a powerful impact. And it was the same for Joy Division, you know, two albums, you know, not discounting the live album and all the rest of it, but it's really two albums and a handful of singles. Um, and and both bands not seen by many people, you know, both bands weren't playing big gigs. They weren't playing, I mean, Joy Division did a lot more than the Pistols, but but they weren't in, in the scheme of things, they weren't seen by as many people as you would expect in the way that, a ba- if a band blows up now, you know, Arctic Monkeys, Nirvana, whoever, you know, that they, they end up seen, being seen by thousands and thousands of people. And for the Pistols and Joy Division, it was very, very few people. I was lucky enough to see Joy Division. Um, and I only saw the Pistols after they reformed, you know, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, they had the, I think they had a massive impact on the on the people that they impacted at the time, and that's just grown and grown, really. And it's funny the the Ian Curtis thing because it did sort of it it kind of his lyrics suddenly made sense a little bit you know there was that there was that line in New Dawn Fades a loaded gun won't set you free so they say you know and I remember even before he died like that that line sort of you leaping out what's that about you know um and then what so when you know when when he dies it you suddenly think that's what it was about you know he was sort of pondering going um it's it's very weird to think like that at a young age when you know that somebody who wasn't that much older than I was, um, had decided to take to get out, you know, and and it's 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 I think that as young people that had a big effect on a lot of people I knew, because you just didn't know people who did that, you know, no one gets off the train, <laughs> you know, it just didn't happen. We'd no experience of that, and so it was very startling and shocking for a lot of us. And then obviously when you get older. You start to realise what it was, you know, what it was about. I've had friends that have, you know, committed suicide, and it's, yeah, yeah it affects you. What's the one aspect that you discovered whilst writing this book about the Sex Pistols that surprised you, or sort of hit you in the face, or or whatever, you know? I f- I think more than anything is the smallness of it all at the time, and. I know Nevermind the Bollocks was a, a hit and all the rest of it, and they were on top of the pops, but when you think that a band that are this, you know, cultural phenomenon, really, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of British culture, were playing below a bingo hall in Whitby at the height of their infamy, and somebody is telling them to be quiet because they're disrupting the bingo, you just think, how on earth <laughs> do you go from there to where they are in terms of history? And I, but I love that. I love the fact that they were playing Knickers and Keithley and you know clubs in North Allerton and 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 to handfuls of people when the outside world were up in outrage. You know there was like they, they, the actual thing was going on in a, in a room of thirty people or whatever. And I I absolutely love that fact. I, 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 that was I think. Finding out the scale of that and the amount of small gigs they played and the relative few big gigs they played um, really brought that home to me. That it, this was a actually quite a small phenomenon at the time, but it's just developed this. It's like throwing a stone into the river. You know, it's a it just causes the ripples and the ripples keep growing. And here we are, you know, forty five years later, and and the ripples are still growing. They're still they're still carrying on. And I love that about it. I love that about the story, you know, that it's not really over. Yeah, well, it's a fantastic read. And I love the fact that you really get to understand their contribution and their influence on so many people directly, you yeah. know, because of these gigs where you, you know, say who's there and everything. Yeah. A direct influence. And 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 it's just a, a, a great read. So Dave Simpson, author of Sex Pistols, I Want to Be Me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>